Uh, if you had a lot of fun this, this week, um, you perhaps almost lost your voice, as I did. So please, uh, I apologize if I sound a little scratchy. <laughs> but um, our next and final speaker for this year's GEDA uh, final meeting <clears throat> is Mr. Ke uh, Curtis Foss, uh, Executive Director for Georgia Ports Authority, a 1,000-person strong port authority uh, that owns and operates strategic gateways serving southeastern, the southeastern U.S. As the Executive Director, uh, he uh, oversees all port activity involving deep water uh, facilities in uh, Savannah and the city of Brunswick, as well as uh, inland terminal um, uh, programs that is in uh, Bainbridge and as well Columbus, Georgia. He has served a number of uh, leadership capacities within the um, Georgia Ports Authority, and he continues to be a very, very strong force in terms of uh, our state's uh, economy. At this time, please join me in welcoming, welcoming Mr. Curtis Falls. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Put that in there. All right, check. Can everybody hear me? There we go. Okay, great to, uh, great to be here with you this morning. Um, I'm not sure how pleased I am to be your last speaker. I'm in the way of you and getting out of here. So uh, I'll make this uh, relatively brief. Um, probably about 25, 30 minutes of comments, and then be happy to take any questions that you might have. Uh, it is great to be here with you. I think as most of you know, our role in the Ports Authority, we play a small role in the broader economic development throughout the state of Georgia. But I think uh, not being a long-term Georgian, but being in this industry that I'm in, the space that I walk in for over three decades, I can tell you no state does it better than the state of Georgia in terms of kind of towing the rope or pulling the rope in a single direction. Uh, we have a great relationship at all the, the, the local levels as well as the state level, and everybody kind of gets that whole need that at the end of the day, we are, we are better and more powerful as a team. So it's, uh, I'm just proud and kind of humbled to be part of that, uh, that stronger organization. I'm going to share with you a little bit about the ports. Uh, it would take far more than the time allotted to, to get you into the details about all of our portfolio that we have across the, the state. Uh, we are, I'm not pushing any buttons yet, okay? So don't blame me for that. All right, let's get started here real quickly. So what do we do as a port authority? As you can see, we've got, uh, we've got multiple uh, facilities throughout the state of Georgia. We have two deep water terminals or primary port facilities here in Savannah. We have a large container facility, the single largest in the United States. We have a general cargo facility that uh, provides outstanding services to our customers uh, kind of across the board. And down in Brunswick, we have three separate uh, terminals, one that has become the third largest auto processing port in the nation, an agribulk facility, and some more general cargo terminals. So we are a statewide authority that kind of oversees the port assets on behalf of the state of Georgia, and we are clearly a multi-faceted functional type organization. Um, every two years, the state of Georgia, not the Georgia Ports Authority, but the state of Georgia does a study through the Terry College of Business about the impact that the ports has throughout the state on jobs and the economy. Uh, the last study was done about two years ago. We've grown significantly th since then, but about two years ago, uh, the ports drove about 352,000 jobs throughout the state of Georgia. About one in eight jobs are somehow connected to the whole logistics element and what we do as a port authority. Uh, I think the other uh, kind of telling sign there is about 18.5 billion of income every year, personal income every year, is driven out of port or logistics related activity that ties back to or can be associated with the ports. Uh, I didn't include this slide, but clearly, our ports, and we promote and sell them, aren't just about Georgia. Our business doesn't stop at the borders of Georgia. Uh, we, we are a southeast play. Uh, we think Georgians benefit for that, but our reach is in the entire southeast. We kind of, our sweet spot takes us through central Florida, really all of South Carolina, most of North Carolina, Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi, are all in our reach and something that we're out marketing every day. And again, we believe that Georgia kind of rides on the back of that broader Southeast benefit. Here's the uh, job impact of your ports in, in each of your different and respective areas. 
So I kind of, uh, I jokingly, to, to a lot of people, remind people that this isn't the Port of Savannah. We're down in Brunswick. It's not the Port of Brunswick. We're the Georgia Ports Authority, and our ports are Georgia. We're just as much Atlanta and Macon and Athens as we are Savannah or Brunswick. In fact, most of the jobs tied to our ports are outside of our local communities. Manufacturing activity, a lot of that's outside and throughout the state. All the kale and clay that comes out of central Georgia, the forest products throughout the state, the poultry, the new Caterpillar plant uh, that's going up, um, the new uh, Starbucks facility that's going to be going up. All those, and then on the consumer side, on the import side, that touches every Georgian. So when you think about the ports, don't just think about the coast. Think about our reach and our, the role that we play in logistics throughout the, uh, throughout the entire state. Uh, just a re real quick uh, recap to give you an update on our most recent year. We, we run on a, 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 the same fiscal year that the state does. So we have a July through June fiscal year. Last year was a record year for us. Again, uh, a little over 27 million tons of cargo through all the different lines of business that we have. Kind of the headlines, uh, 2.9 million TEUs. That's an acronym that probably doesn't mean anything to you. That's how we, the unit measure, we measure the container volumes that we handle. So almost 2.9 million units. Uh, the fourth busiest port complex in the United States, the single busiest terminal in the United States, and in the top 50 in the world coming through this small town. 637,000 automobiles and machinery units. That was double-digit growth last year. The vast majority of that in Colonel's Island. And as I mentioned earlier, the third busiest auto processing port in the nation and exports are starting to become something that's more and more popular. About two-thirds of that, though, was, was imports. Uh, rail is an important, an increasingly important part of our business. We had a record year in, in rail activity. Most of that container-related, 315,000 uh, units or containers were moved in or out of here via rail, and 2.5 million tons of both dry and liquid bulk. So all in all, a record year for strong growth across, uh, really across all areas. Uh, on the kind of the, 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 the local test of what's going on in our business, not just taking market share from other ports, but as the local economy starting to improve, our business is starting to look towards leasing additional space that's port-centric in, in this area. Uh, we had a good year last year, a little over a million square footage of available lease space was absorbed last year a fairly strong absorption rate, about a little over 25%, so from 14.3 down to 11.8%. And today we're seeing, a still continuing to see, a lot of activity in that field. So that's kind of a leading indicator for us, at least, in the ports, that things are continuing to heat up. Certainly not as hot as they were in, in 2004, 5, or 6, but things are drastically improving from where they were three years ago. One of, the, uh, one of the pieces of our business that's quite often forgotten is our reinvesting into the state and into the local economy. We spend about, we as a Port Authority, and I should say, because most don't realize, we're owned by the state, but we're not state employees. We don't fall under the state's budgeting system. Me, nor the other thousand GPA employees, our state employees, we don't get state benefits, we're not on the state's pension plan, we're not on the state's health care plan. We are a self-funding, self-generating organization that is responsible for servicing 100% of our own debt. So as we grow, we're growing on the revenues that we're generating and the contracts that we're negotiating on the business. Over the next 10 years, we will reinvest into this state about $1.4 billion. So a little over $100 million a year we're putting back into expansion, new properties, modernization, and all that is helping drive job growth in this area. So about $100 million a year. It's a fairly significant amount for a port of our size. Uh, this is a, just gives you an idea of the different areas that, uh, that we're going to be investing in. And you'll see there's a, there's a bigger number at the bottom of this. So over the next 10 years, 
we'll, you'll see at that, that first subtotal about 1.4 billion. And those are the different projects that they're involved in. Way too much detail, and each of those have several different sublines on them. And then below that, that next line, that big one, that 652 million, is our deepening project. And the reason we kind of separate that out, that's not, from a financial standpoint, that's not the responsibility of the GPA, the Ports Authority. It's a shared responsibility of the federal government and the state of Georgia. You need to think of that river that's out here as a federal highway. It's a federal waterway, so it's a federal responsibility. And when you modify that federal highway, you expand it, there's a shared responsibility. About a good rule of thumb is about two-thirds the federal government, one-third the state of Georgia. So when you look at the ports and you think about the next decade, know that there'll be about $2 billion that is spent enhancing our capacity, modernizing our ports to make sure that they are staying the top ports in the United States so that we're not only the preferred gateway for commerce in the southeast, as you think about international trading and attracting companies to come do business in your area, we are strong financially and we're continuing to invest in the future to make sure that we are capable of handling all the growth that wants to come our way. And when people are looking to do business in the state of Georgia that has an international component and they see their ports as the, the, the gateway to that commerce, they can feel confident and comfortable that we are there to reinvest in the future and build for the future. This is kind of an interesting slide. It's a busy slide. Don't get lost in the details. But one of the other things that, that's unique about us as a port authority, every, uh, you can't find another, another port in the country that, number one, has the financial plan that I just shared with you, but also has taken a, a long-term, 10-year strategic play in what we're doing. And this slide kind of represents it. We're in the middle of another one right now. And it's uh, what we call our 10-year strategic plan. This one took us through 2022. So when you see that 22 on the bottom, that's year 2022. We're currently working on our 2014 or 2015, 2014 plan, 2024 plan. I'm sorry. And all it represents is where it starts is with a commercial forecast. That's the bars at the bottom. It takes us through our growth. And as you can see right now on the container side of our business, we do about 3 million TEUs of, of, of units through our, our ports, and we expect over the next 10 years that that grow to close to 5 million TEUs. And the red line, what the red line represents, are the projects that we have to do to make sure that we've got the capacity to support that volume projection. And I think the, the kind of the headline I'll leave you lit, with on this slide is that one of the things that the vision that our port and our, our board has had is they've given us kind of a mandate and a directive to say, authority, we want you at any given time to be planning for capacity that exceeds the forecasted demand by about 20%. These are long lead kind of growth requirements. And what they don't, what they, and the reason this is in, uh, very uh, important in our business is quite often you get these unintended or unpredictable uh, spikes in business, whether they're related to the economy, whether they're related to some sort of one-time event at a neighboring port or maybe even on a neighboring coast. And our board wants to make sure that if that happens, we can catch that additional volume and handle it very efficiently. So the other thing is to just think, not only are we building for the future, we're always planning to handle more business than is actually forecast to handle through our ports. So you don't get the, the typical congestion that you're going to see at many of the port facilities. Here's our terminal, ten, the container facility 10 years ago, and what you'll kind of notice on it, again, it may not mean anything to, to you. Uh, this is a 1,200-acre facility. It's the single largest in the United States. It's the single busiest terminal in the United States. Yesterday, we received and dispatched out on the roadway 8,300 trucks. We sent out another 1,000 containers via rail, and we unloaded and loaded another 5,000 containers on and off ships. So in this one facility yesterday alone, we handled about 14,000 containers in one day. And that's kind of a typical day there. This is how the facility looked about 10 years ago, and you'll see it, there are different uh, kind of directionals, some perpendicular and some parallel. 
And basically, this is what it looks like uh, today. Quite a change, a dramatic change. Uh, in that 10-year time, we've spent a little over $750 million making this conversion. But now you're looking at a modern terminal, modern layout, both Class 1 railroads on it, a lot of capacity, really across the board. And one that we've modeled the facility and our planning in that 10-year plan that I shared with you, we can more than double the current capacity. So again, from handling about 3 million TEUs, those units, to about 6.5 million TEUs long term. You will not, without exception, find another port in the United States that has the ability on their current footprint or at least even future defined properties that can accommodate that sort of growth. And we've identified two other properties beyond that. So if we can, if we can get our friends in South Carolina to work with us on a joint bi-state project, I can tell you we've already identified capacity for the next 50 years in this region, and we believe the southeast region with all the demographic streak going on, that's another real strong play for, uh, for our ports. Not only when you, when you think about ports, if you happen to travel, which I do quite a bit and I've actually uh, run many of them, when you go around the United States, you go into a place like the ports in New York, you go into Southern California ports, LA, Long Beach, Pacific Northwest in Seattle or Tacoma, Oakland, California, Charleston, Norfolk ports, tremendous congestion around the ports. You almost can't miss it. It's a challenge just to get from the highway system into the ports. One of the things that makes us extremely unique is that we've focused heavily in a combination with our private sector partners, railroad partners, CSX and Norfolk Southern, as well as the state of Georgia, to make sure that those connectivity points or that freight mobility beyond the ports is well taken care of. If you can get it into the ports and you can unload it efficiently on or off ships into your port facilities, but you can't get it into the freight system, you can't get it into the economic development system, you haven't accomplished anything. But we've done an outstanding job and really have second to none both rail and road access. And I'll take you through just a couple of, of these features. The first of which, and they change this slide on me all the time, so I'm going to need to probably go through about, if you'll bear with me, about uh, when we get to the, to the punchline, and I don't want to pass it. Um, I think there's one more. Nope, sorry. Hold on, let me go back. Okay. This is, a, uh, this is a, a, a beltway, a highway beltway that we're creating with the state of Georgia to create direct highway access into our container facilities. Now, folks, if you've been any other port in this country, <clears throat> these simply just don't exist. To have this, what we're doing is going to bring I-95 and I-16 directly into our container facility with a freight, kind of a freight corridor. The largest of that is the arrow to Jimmy DeLoach Parkway, they just started clearing about two weeks ago. Um, that's a project that will, within the next 18 months, bring I-95 and a separated four-lane highway directly in to our container facility. The smallest piece of that, the Brampton Road connector you see in your upper right, um, is about an eight-tenths of a mile project. We're working with the state on now. It's on DOT schedule. We'll, we expect to get appropriated funds for that within the next couple of years. But really, this is about building that inland piece that's going to serve the needs for the next 20 years. It's not really needed today, but that's kind of the forward-thinking process and approach that the state's taken. And by the way, that Jimmy DeLoach Parkway, both Governor Deal and the General Assembly last year appropriated about $130 million for that kind of last-mile project. So between the state, Paige Siplon, and his efforts to kind of elevate logistics throughout the state and how all that's needed, the support we get from the Department of Economic Development, freight movement, logistics movement throughout the state has continued to be high on that priority list because they get the fact that that's what's going to drive that whole infrastructure piece for freight and commerce is going to drive most, if not all, of our economic development plans that we're looking for here in the state of Georgia. One of a kind in the United States. Nobody can even touch something like that. One of our other efforts, and we're, we're proud to say this is kind of a, this is a teaser, I'll call it, uh, on what we're going to be doing. Um, we were proud 
couple of, about a month or two ago, uh, we were out in Cordell, Georgia, announcing the first of what you'll see will be many kind of nodes throughout the state of Georgia that are going to improve our rail connectivity. Um, we have a, an initiative underway to convert truck to rail where we can. It makes economic sense. It makes environmental sense. And it's going to help congestion our roadways. So Cordell is a nice little play in that part of Georgia that's going to open up new opportunities to bring rail, service rail that heretofore was only serviced via truck. So it was a good move. But it's really the first start of this. <clears throat> we call it Network Georgia. And it's something that's uh, started, at, uh, started out of the GPA. Again, a lot of help with Paige and, and his group in, in the uh, logistics innovation uh, group. But we've identified kind of six corridors, six areas throughout Georgia that we're going to make sure that in terms of its port connectivity, so it isn't just highway act, but port connectivity, we want to make sure each of those zones are optimized in a service solution or transportation solution to get it to the ports. In zone one is where Cordell was, so that was kind of the first. Um, I won't, we are heavily working on that next play. It'll probably be available for announcement within the next three or four months. I don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but just know that we're advanced. We're, we're well on the way. And, but each of those areas, we're going to position our ports to service them better than any other, better than any other port, uh, in the, not only in the southeast, but on the east coast of the United States. All right, what's going on with Panama Canal? Uh, clearly, it's the most uh, talked about subject in, in my world. Um, for the last probably three or four years. There hasn't been a single conference I've been to, and they, I think they have them about every week, that this isn't the subject. What is it? What is it? What does it mean for commerce, and what's it going to mean for the East Coast, and what's going to happen to trade? Well, I'm going to take you through a couple of those. Uh, this could be an hour-long conversation. I can guarantee it's not. Uh, this is going to be a, a, a two-minute soundbite. Thirty-five percent of the population uh, is currently uh, resides directly on the East Coast of the United States. 25% of the commerce is coming to there, so there's a 10% opportunity, we believe. Not all that's going to occur overnight, but there's clearly a huge opportunity to better service commerce on the East Coast. And that's really what the, the, the Panama Canal expansion is about a lot more than the East Coast, but in terms of our subject matter, it's going to be very important. Why is it important? Uh, many of you have probably seen this slide, but if you haven't, I just got back from Panama on Tuesday. I was down with the governor. Uh, try to get down there at least once a year to, to see its progress. But effectively, it's going to take ships that are limited today, both in their size and their draft. And oh, by the way, we are benefited from it today because the Panama Canal acts as a speed bump. It only allows ships that are drawing 39 feet of water. And with our limitation on the Savannah River right now, that's kind of helping us. Well, that, that restriction goes away in what now looks like mid-2015. The uh, 100th year anniversary of the Panama Canal its first opening is in August of next year, or August of 2014. That's the 100th year anniversary. Those small locks, or the small size on the top, those locks haven't been modified in 100 years. Well, they're going through a major $5.2 billion expansion as we speak, introducing a third set of locks, and that's what's depicted on the bottom of this slide. In its simplest terms, ships three size three times larger than the size today that can come through the Panama Canal will be transiting the Panama Canal, bringing better economies of scale for goods, better competitiveness for goods coming to the East Coast, but larger ships that are drawing deeper water. And that's what concerns us about the current condition of our Savannah River. So SHEP, which is the Savannah Harbor Expansion Project, that's the deepening of the river, We've got to get that done as quickly as we possibly can. Time is of the essence. For those of you that have heard me before, this project started, and it's a shame, it's a federal project, started in 1996. Congress officially authorized it in 1999, not 2009, in 1999, 14 years ago. It underwent 13 years of studying, $41 million of studying, on something that we all know that needs to happen intuitively. But we did receive what's referred to as a record of decision. That was the final study, so that was the core 
advising the federal government that it needs to happen last October. We then completed a, a mediation of a challenge in the state of South Carolina amongst many groups, successfully concluded that. In a good milestone last year was the General Assembly and the governor appropriated another $50 million for the state's portion to get the state's funding up to $231 million, almost completing their portion of the total project. Here's what we need to do and we expect to happen, I'd say over the next uh, six months. We expect in next year's uh, state budget to finalize the state's portion, about another $30 million of the state funding to get it up to $262 million. There's a procedural piece that needs to be addressed through Congress, raising the funding level uh, of the total current cost to $652 million. The technical side of that is there's a bill that's currently working through Congress. We had the chairman that's overseeing that bill, was here two days ago or yesterday, Chairman Schuster, and uh, we expect that to happen by the end of the year. And then we certainly hope in the next federal budget cycle, which is fiscal year 15, which is currently being put together now, that it will now be time for the federal government to stand tall and put some significant federal dollars in there. So that's kind of where this thing stands. If that happens, the project then officially starts second quarter of next year with the Corps awarding large construction contracts, and it'll take us until about mid-year 2017 to complete the entire project, the, at least the dredging work of it. Currently, we recently had, he got a lot of press, uh, uh, Pre Vice President Biden here. I think that signals well. I think really the broader thing, just so you know, on this deepening, it's taken so long, but in the last three months, we've had the Undersecretary of the Army, the highest ranking civilian in the Army, and the Army Corps of Engineers falls underneath the Army, visit the port about SHEP. We had Vice President Biden visit, talking about SHEP. And then we had, again, yesterday, we had Chairman Schuster, congressman out of Pennsylvania, who chairs the Infrastructure and Transportation Committee that's helping us on this last kind of congressional fix, visit the port with Congressman Kingston. So I think it's safe to say there's been a lot of visibility, and generally with that type of visibility, we would expect good things to follow very soon. Um, as we've grown our ports, I, I think one of the things that, uh, that my, at least I and I believe our entire team and our board's very proud of is that we're growing it in a responsible, uh, from an environmental standpoint, a responsible way. Candidly, five years ago, we weren't there. In the last five years, we've rapidly become the port that's known on the entire East Coast as a port that is the most committed to environmental stewardship. This was a 350-plus-year-old tree along with another 350-year-old-plus tree plus about a dozen 200-year-old trees that we carved out an area right in the middle of our port that, candidly, the space typically would be used for a lot of other things, but we carved out this protective area to protect these trees really in perpetuity and something that is just a small sign of, of what we're trying to do. Uh, we are doing on the full diesel emission front across the, the page. We were proud last year to be the first port in the United States. This is a picture of an all-electric piece of equipment that we use to move containers. First in the United States, again, taking on a leadership role, use 95% less diesel than they did the uh, kind of the typical units. Diesel in general, diesel reduction has been a major mission of ours for four years. What you see in the background are some refrigerated racking systems. We're the number one port in the nation in terms of refrigerated export. We export about 1,100 containers of poultry every week. But the broader diesel reduction, conservatively with a lot of electrification, more efficient engines, uh, less use of older equipment, we've reduced about 3.5 million gallons of diesel use every year on the conservative side. We believe that's closer to about 5 million gallons of diesel fuel every year. And by the way, I should say all these efforts, not one is locally, state, or federally mandated. We've done every single one of these on our own because of the right things to do for our community, uh, for our businesses, for our, our partners in business, and for the state of Georgia. All right, so just real quickly wrapping this thing up. Uh, so what are our advantages as a port and focusing in on the, on the container facility? We, again, 
different than most ports in the United States. We own them on behalf of the state of Georgia, but we also operate them. We're on a single facility, the largest and busiest in the United States, but being in a single facility offers tremendous synergies. We're the fourth busiest container port in the United States in pretty good company, considering the only three that are larger than us are Long Beach and LA, uh, in LA, Los Angeles, California, and the combined ports of New York, New Jersey. Um, we have two on class two class one terminals on port, as I mentioned earlier, uh, with Norfolk Southern and CSX. We're the only port in the eastern half of the United States that, that has that benefit. 37 container vessels that call here every single week to really every corner of the globe. So if you've got anybody that wants to compete for commerce around the world, they're there. And if you don't think the big ships are already here, we, are, uh, we already have them here in Savannah. Very large ships already calling. They're coming through the Suez Canal. Uh, we have 11 ships a week, 11 services that come from Asia through the Suez Canal. But our deepening needs to happen as quickly as it can. So I know I'm your last speaker. I appreciate your patience. I appreciate all of y'all being here for the last uh, speaker. That's pretty amazing. So I'll be happy to take any questions if there's time. If not, thank y'all and thanks for coming to Savannah. Do we have some questions? Paige, imagine you asking a question. No, you're going to tell a story. You're not going to ask me a question. Not me, that's for sure. <laughs> is, is, where's Petrino? He's got to be in here. John Petrino, stand up right over there. John Petrino, Stacy Watson would be your, your kind of lead contact for us. And the question was who to connect with. Those were the men. Yes. So, other questions? Gosh, they must be wanting to go home. What can I say? I don't blame you. I'd be wanting to go. Y'all, thank you very much. Oh. <laughs> Joanne, can I just say a huge thank you because, Curtis, you do a great job informing us and informing everyone else in leading the Georgia Ports Authority. But I've had the great opportunity, as Tom has and members of, of this team, to witness the work he does overseas and his group does overseas, not only to take care of selling the ports, but selling Georgia and our community. So thank you, Curtis. Well, we thanks, appreciate Rachel. it. That's very nice of you. Thank you. And Curtis, on behalf of GDA, we would like to present you with this certificate. A donation has been made in your honor to read across Georgia. Very good. And Thank uh, you. it's all about educating our students for our future workforce that the ports is going to help us create jobs. Thank for. You. Te Team Georgia, we're all one here. Thank we you. We are. Thank you so much, Curtis. Okay, Mary Ellen. Um, Mike, is the team ready? Hey, Peggy. Oh. Door prize time while they're coming up. Uh, let's give Tim Evans and his crew another big round of applause for a great conference. I'm sure you'll be receiving a survey um, on the conference, how you liked it, how we can improve it. Make sure you take time to complete that survey.